folks, welcome to Time to Talk with Rachel Bean. Had such a lovely hour talking to Rachel about all things to do with dogs, uh, rescue dogs, first aid, street dogs, sow down, soy dogs, a uh, real lovely insight into all of the wonderful things that Rachel does. So get yourself a cup of tea, settle back, and enjoy an hour of talking to Rachel Bean. Thanks for listening. Take care. Stay safe. Bye bye. Hi, folks. I'm here with the lovely Rachel Bean, and I'm really looking forward to talking to her. I've known Rachel for a little while now, and um, she does so many things. I've got this big list. <laughs> I've printed off her Facebook page to make sure I cover everything. <laughs> but um, yeah, we're just going to go for it and just ramble and chat and see where it takes us. So, Rachel, yeah, we hello. Do how are you doing? <laughs> I'm all right. How are you? Good. You've been busy, busy, busy. I see you everywhere at the minute. You like? Yeah. I'm, well, it, it, yeah. But I think because of COVID, I mean, it'd be so easy just to kind of drop off the end of a cliff, wouldn't it, and disappear. But I think um, you know, if you pick up any business after this is all over, we've got to keep uh, current and keep keep in the loop, keep out there. So yeah. So things like this, interviews and stuff, is yeah, it's fab, fab. Oh, it's great, isn't it? Just to be yeah. able to connect with people and um, let people know what's happening. And for me, uh, this podcast is all about the people behind the brand. So I know a lot of people have been doing this first, do first aid with you, and let's talk about different types of first aid. But for me, I want to get to the person behind the amazing Rachel Bean, who does all these wonderful first aid courses and who. Yeah travels all over the place and looks after dogs. So um, the most important question, I suppose, is why veterinary nursing? So you tell me what you are first and then I'm going to unpick everything. Okay. Yeah. All right. You so are... yeah, I mean, I, I, I started, um, God, 1994. Uh -huh. I started at the Dogs Trust, which was then the National Canine Defence League. Um, so if you can remember that, then... I can remember that, <laughs> it was back then. <laughs> yeah. So that was actually a brand new, um, the Darlington branch, Sadbirds branch, because I'm originally from the North East. So yeah, it was that, that original, it was brand new kennels at the time. Um, and I was, I was, I, I'd left school, it was, it was I was kind of like 24, 24, I think. Yeah, so it was, I know like a, a job, a part-time job that just... Um, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't me, um, and a part-time job working on a farm, um, a farm near my dad's, um, so it wasn't really, yeah, so anyway, this, this, the kennels opened up at Darlington, which was about, about 15 miles away from my dad's house, which is where I was living at the time, um, and he said, I was going for the, um, what was the kennel maid's job, now it's canine carers, you know, to make it more politically correct. Oh, very politically correct. <laughs> yeah, back then, it was kennel maid. Kennel maid. Um, but um, yeah, uh, but also the assistant manager's job was going up as well. Um, and I was young, I, you know, I'd obviously been around dogs, but, um, you know, family dogs and what have you. And my dad um, has, uh, uh, you know, does some refuting and what have you. Um, and farm dogs, sheep dogs and what have you. And so I had no, but I had no experience in management and, and that kind of thing. So my dad said, just go for the assistant manager's job as well. So I did, and I didn't think anything of it. And yeah, I got the, got the job. Um, and then, yeah, then I pooped myself. <laughs> I said, oh, no. <laughs> oh my God, what luckily, have I just agreed to? <laughs> yeah, but luckily, because it was a brand new kennels, actually when I started, um, I started there, there was just me and the manageress. There was no, there was no staff. There was no dogs. So it, was, it, it actually helped because I was there from dog one. And before I knew it, you're in that role and six months down the line, you've got 140 dogs, uh, you know, looking after. Um, did so you I was there for the kennels as well, Rachel? If you, you know, if you were first in, did you yeah. find the kennels as well? Because I know some of the kennels, you look at these, um, these rescue kennels and you go, they're amazing. And some of them you go, Ooh, you know, they need yeah, it was already built. Yeah. It was already, already built. built. Yeah. And it was the first dogs trust kennels that, um, what we call the cake slice kennels. So it was the circular kennels. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So they had four of those. Um, I think they might have you know, changed again. I mean, this is 25 years ago. Um, but, um, I think there was two, uh, dogs trust branches that had the cake slice kennels so there was a central area where um, you know uh, there's a little kitchen area the prep was done and then the central area is quite a lot of space so each kennel was like a yeah 
that's why it's cake slice. So people could walk around the outside and there's shutters in the middle so you can let them in and out and what have you. Yeah, but it was, it was 140 capacity. We also had the stray kennel, um, the uh, contract for Darlington Council and, oh, okay, and, and stray dogs. So, yeah, so stray dogs. So we had, you know, we had um, dog wardens coming in and out, police coming in and out, um, RSPCA. So it was really, really a busy shelter. So actually the two years that I was there, uh, it was really good grounding for you know what I wanted to continue and, and do and yeah it was, it was just really good really good experience you know back in those days it was more dog handling um getting difficult dogs out of kennels yeah. um they did have a euthanasia policy then um it changed um probably about three or four years after I left I think maybe a bit sooner than that uh, non-destruction policy um but back in those days, we were euthanizing um, the most difficult dogs. Um, yeah. So yeah, you know, I was I was front line, very young, and but yeah, got a massive amount of experience, handling experience, definitely. Um, I left there. I was there for a couple of years, um, only because I was I was because I was assistant manager. I wasn't really hands on with the dogs as much. It was more staffing issues dog numbers, oh, telling yeah, up at the end of the day, all that kind of thing, yeah. So I was young enough and I thought, well, I'm just going to bite the bullet and just try and try and qualify as a veterinary nurse. So yeah, I just applied within a 100 mile radius of Darlington and that that's what brought me down to Manchester really. So the Manchester area, so I've been down here uh -huh. ever since, yeah. So you, because um, I know, well, I, I don't know actually, but I'm assuming that when you do the vet nurse and you go to college part time and then you work, because I know from the vets that I've, been in contact with you know my old vets the vet nurses who would be working on reception and learning the craft kind yeah. of behind you, you know when they weren't on reception they'd be helping out with operations and looking after the dogs and the cats and yeah we would go to college one or two days a week as well to study for their exams is that, yeah. is that the standard format yeah it is uh, i mean it's slightly changed um since i was doing my training i I, when I left the Dogs Trust at nine, in 96, I went straight into practice because um, I got a job as a student veterinary nurse down, down near Oldham. Um, and, but I had to wait about 18 months to start my training because it was quite a small practice. There's already a girl training, so it ha I had to wait until she was finished before I could start. So I was working in practice um, for about 18 months before I actually started the actual course training but yeah um back then uh, similar now but the, the only difference now is that they have um a degree course um which is a four-year course the extra year is in practice management so that that's the only difference really um the way the trains are slightly different um you know it's changed from nbq or i can't remember the combination but anyway back then it was um it it was one i did day release so for two years Mm -hmm. um i went to college one day a week mm -hmm. um for yeah for two years and that was at myers core college which is an agricultural college in near preston um so yeah you can do day release or you can do block release so that means you go to college for three weeks at a time and you stay there uh -huh. um or um oh yeah i think oh the degree course which is full-time um at university because it's a degree um and then um you get placements so um you, it, whatever combination you do it you have to have a job at a vet so you have to be working at a vet i think yeah. it's minimum Mm, don't quote me it used to be 18 hours a week I think uh, but uh, yeah and the practice has to be a training practice you can't just um, go to any practice the practice has to reach a certain standard and it's got to be a training practice mm -hmm. and there's got to be a mentor there as well so somebody's got to have the D32 D33 um, to be a mentor so okay. either yeah you can do that um, so either a vet either a vet or a veterinary nurse has got to be um, a, a mentor there as well so it's time consuming for the staff so I, th I think that's what's happened the last few years because a lot of these big corporates vets have taken over Ch veterinary practices changing yeah so um a lot of nurses um well it's difficult to get a nurse training place basically because you've got really? to have the combination of a training practice that's got a place available and the college placement get all those three married together then you're okay but generally it's very difficult to get those three married at the same time yeah so um that's really but, tough because it's it's a I, I can imagine it being a, a, a really rewarding profession but a really difficult mm. profession as well because i can remember um down at riverside when i was at marlborough i used to see the vets a lot you know she was a really good friend and yeah the vet nurse were, was always the front 
end for the emergencies coming in, but yeah. also the front yeah. end for the stressed owners coming in for a shout. And a yeah, oh, definitely. And kind yeah. of the buffer all the time, aren't you? And then having yeah, we get it. We get it both yeah. barrels, you know. Really, yeah. You know, one one client might be you, you know you're helping with the euthanasia and you're comforting that client, and then within seconds you've got somebody arguing about the bill. You know, it's ooh, it's like that. Yeah, you've got to be very resilient. Yeah, um, very level-headed. Yeah, definitely. So, have you ever have you have the ever had a break from veterinary nurse? No, it has, it, that has been your mainstay profession all the way through. Because I know you do other things, so I'm going to ask you about them as well. But yeah. the, the veterinary nursing has been the mainstay, the underpinning. It is, all yeah. All the way through, yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't be able to do all the other things that I'm doing without my vet nurse degree, without a doubt. And I, I wouldn't um, mm, promote a lot of the stuff that I do if I didn't have that, if I didn't have that qualification and that experience, yeah. 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 But quite often when you say to somebody, if you're talking about animals or dogs, you say, oh, I'm an RVN. They say, oh, right, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, go on then, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd um, uh, just on that subject, I'd, a few, few weeks back, um, because we've got some really nice, um, I'm in Saddleworth, so uh, when you go over the tops, you've got, we've got lovely reservoirs, and there's quite a lot of sheep up there, yeah, and somebody on a bad bend had, had hit um, like a half-grown lamb, and it was still alive, and I stopped, and this, this guy, he didn't know what to do, you know, he, he'd never, he'd probably never been near a sheep, he, he, you know, he was panicking, he didn't know what to do, and I said, mm, the sheep, yeah, I know who owns them, so I phoned um, the he's got a farm shop so I found the farm shop and I said oh one of David's sheep has been hit and um, he said how do you know I said well how do you know it's one of David's I said well I phoned Helen up on the hill and she said it's one of David's anyway he came round in his transit old guy just a traditional old farmer oh, yeah, yeah. you know he said oh right right okay um, he says you might want to look away I'm going to shoot it he had a shoot bolt um, I said I'm a veterinary nurse he says oh right you can hold it then <laughs> <laughs> well in that case get your hands in here <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it is. It is well respected most of the time. Sometimes it's not, you know. But it's usually the people on, uh, dog, you know, people on social media and what have you. As soon as you chip in, it's like, oh, you think you're a veterinarian? You're a veterinarian? Oh, you're thinking about all and it's social like, media. Is just, ah, yeah. yeah is. <laughs> we'll on, I'm sure we'll get onto that at some point. We'll get with little morning hats on. But I, mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I think vets and vet, I mean, I would love to. Um, to do something more hands-on because you know I teach anatomy and physiology and and getting in the thick of it I can remember having to dissect a fetal pig and just like oh my god that's what the diaphragm looks like oh look if I lift yeah. lung out, and I, if I lift a lung out I can see that and it was just absolutely fascinating um it must be really you must have lots of wow moments when you're working like that do oh you? yeah yeah definitely <laughs> definitely yeah I mean I came out of full time just going back to what we we're saying before I came out of full time practice probably about eight uh no oh, it must be getting over 10 years now so I was doing more behavior stuff and all these other little things came up so it was just impossible to be still working in full-time practice it's yeah. long shifts it's weekends and you're on call and that kind of thing um so yeah I went to I went I first of all dropped down to three days a week uh -huh. and then I dropped down to just working Fridays for about four or five months and before I went full-time self-employed but I'm a locum so I've never come out of veterinary nursing I'm a locum so that means I just I can pick and choose when I work um, and I've got about four or five practices, uh, regular ones that I work um, um, at the drop of the hat, you know, so it might be something that's off ill or on holiday, yeah. And I, I'm quite handy for them because I don't mind doing just odd days or even just odd mornings where a lot of locum nurses will only book the work if it's a full week, which oh, really? um, I understand, you know, it's, you know, it's uh, for financial reasons. That, um, but, but I'm handy for some vets because, yeah, I'll just go in. I can just go in. I'm happy to just go in for a day, one day a week, you know um sometimes it's just once theatre's finished um you know i'm just in there just to, to help in theatre once the the theatre list done then you can go you go yeah, yeah so so i'm quite flexible so i'm quite useful for, for a few vets around here that's, that's really handy my one of my nieces is a vet and she's a logum she set herself up as a logum i think it's the beginning of last year and she mm. loves this she loves being a logum yeah, it's not for everybody. You know, yeah. it's it isn't for everybody. Some people like the stability of being in one practice, um, and it's quite daunting when you first go because when you first start, because when you go into you know, because that because I was at a practice, the same practice for thirteen years, so you know the practice inside out. And as soon as you step out and then go into another practice, and like you know, the bandages are in a different place and all that kind of thing. It's like, where's this? Where's that? Uh -huh. um, oh, we don't do it like that. And uh, yeah. 
but once once you get past that, it's yeah, it's fine. <laughs> it's it's like it's because i used to do contracting in it and it's like when you go into that new place and it's like now do i say to them that this other place did it better or do yeah. i keep my mouth shut you know do i give them the advice of my experience and go yeah oh, well if you did it this way or do you just go you know what i'm contracting let me just come in do what they want me to do and then yeah and then be done. I, I only really step in with, with the clinical stuff I don't I just, I just do their protocols but sometimes I'll step in if I see somebody trying to get a dog out of the kennel and they're doing it all wrong you know or I've got a better way I'll, I'll step in there because um that, that's that, that's my role really now is to, is to pass that 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 knowledge on and those skills on you know um sometimes you know if you've got like a shepherd or a rotty behind a, a gate and it's just doing a bit of kennel guarding but it's not being aggressive great it's just woo, 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 woo. So just open the gate <laughs> it'll stop as soon as you open the gate it'll stop yeah oh well i'm, I'm going out this door i'll watch i'll watch through the window you could do it open the gate comes out hello put it on the lead and so it's just it's just guarding just open the gate fine <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I'm taking it your favourite while you were a vet nurse, uh, while you vet nursing as dogs, or have you got like yeah. an exotic that you really love? Or um, I didn't really work much with exotics. Um, we we used to the the practice that I used to be at for 13 years in, in Rochdale. We had an Australian vet for us um, for quite was about two or three years. He's back in Australia now. He's got his own practice. Um, but that means we, we used to work in um, a, a zoo vet um, in Australia. So he has an awful lot of experience with parrots and things like that. Um, African greys. We used to get the whole of Rochdale's African greys in for wing, wing clipping and nails clipping and, and what have you. So, yeah, he was the main um, big bird handler as it were and, and when it when he left then yeah he said right you can do it now so i managed to do it for for a bit but then you just lo lose your lose your nerve a little bit when he's there it's not too bad he makes you do it and he shows you how to catch them properly so you don't get bit if you get bitten by a parrot you'll know about it mm. even cockatiels give you a nasty bite yeah. um so yeah so i managed i managed for about six or eight months um clipping clipping wings and things like that getting hold of them um but they just lose you get a few nips and just lose your bottle a little bit <laughs> i mean when when they open the wings that you're the huge I, I, I used to have a cockatiel and yeah um and even i mean they're really noisy little things on there but they they do have a nip so Rachel I know you as a behaviourist more than a vet nurse although saying that I have been on first aid courses with you um why why did you move across to the behaviour side what what was the turning point for you to go from full-time vet nurse and to canine behaviour specialist which you all you know canine behaviour um what was it yeah I, I mean it started back in the dogs trust because you know back in 1994 because you know, the majority of dogs that were ended up in, in the Dogs Trust um, were, were because of problem behaviours. So I was working with problem dogs way back then. Um, and you just don't realise that you're doing it, you know, and you're gathering practical um, um, experience as you're going along. You just don't realise that you're doing that. Um, and then when I went into veterinary practice, it, you know, all the puppies coming in, I was just giving advice straight away. You know, a lot of vet nurses, new vet nurses that they haven't really, unless you've got an interest in it, they don't really um, concentrate on, 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 on behaviour. I mean, we still get reports of vets and veterinary nurses giving the most appalling behaviour advice out. Mm -hmm. It's right, they are. But um, there's also some really good vets and vet nurses, it's like any profession, isn't there, that are really interested in and really good and will give the correct advice. But um, yeah, I was giving advice right from day one, um, just because of my two years at Dogs Trust. I was working with problem dogs front line, so it was just natural for me. And it just went through right through my veterinary nurse career, just to a point where I was getting um, some more serious issues and, and actually doing proper consultations. And yeah, it just went from there, really. Um, and I think timing age-wise as well, um, so I'm a similar age to you, aren't you? They're all 50 now. Um, it was like, oh, it was a bit too... Right, you, you brought it up. How old are you? 50. You're not as old as me. You're not as old as me. <laughs> you asked me the other day, I says, oh, we're the same age. And he says, how old do you think I am? And I says, well, 53. And you went, I'm 48. And I went, oh, my God. <laughs> so uh, I, th I think timing-wise for me, doing the whole degree thing was just bad timing, really, age-wise. You know, I don't... Um, if I've been... If I'd been like 30, 35 now, as, as the, the dog business is now, mm -hmm. um, I would have gone down the degree route. Mm -hmm. um, but because I'm 50 and 
it's a, it's a difficult one. I don't want to be in debt for however many thousands of pounds it costs. Um, know. You know, I don't want to be forever working, being in, being in debt and studying. Mm -hmm. You know, when do you get to a point where you think, right, use your knowledge that you've got to help people. Don't keep that knowledge and keep studying. <laughs> so you know it's, it's a bit of yeah it was a bit of a mm -mm, what do I do um and I think I would only be forced to do a degree because of pressure from other professionals there's that usual imposter syndrome pressure from other professionals that always say you have to have a degree I'm not I'm not I'm not a scientist I'm not an academic you know oh yeah I've got a good level of intelligence because to pass a vet nurse a degree um, it's not an easy course you know I've got a degree of, of intelligence but I'm not an academic um yeah. and the general public I think if you've got Mrs Smith that's 72 would do two back in Yorkshire Terry she doesn't need an academic you yeah. know she just needs somebody to go in there and help with her on her level to reduce yeah. her back in Yorkshire Terriers I don't think it takes a scientist to do that it's really interesting isn't it because um, the, the there's a I mean I knew you when I think I knew you before I got my degree and but I mean the reason I went after my master's was because I was so fed up. I was going up to London as you know to, to all the meetings over and um, the Companion Animal Welfare Council. Mm. I was just so fed up of academics telling trainers and behaviourists how to hold the lead and how to do this and how to do that. And there were academics that weren't on the ground in the front line dealing with aggressive dogs. And so that was what um, spurred me on to go and get my master's. I think it was bloody mindedness, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, but you've had you've had yours a while now, though, haven't you? I mean, it's a good while ago that you. Uh, yeah, twenty twenty eleven. Yeah, so, I mean, I wouldn't you know. afford to do it now. You know, yeah, when I did it, it was it was expensive, but I mean now. Yeah, I mean it was it was around about that time. Yeah, yeah, it was about around about that time. I had to make a decision whether to do it or not, and I just decided not to. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I that, that I was the reason I, I don't didn't. Think, yeah, I mean, I don't, don't think I regret it. You know, it's, it's not it's not hindered me in, a, in any way not having it. I've just, I've just concentrated on, little, on my niches, really, with behaviour now. You know, to, 10 years ago, I'd probably take more or less every case on. But now I just take cases that, that I would enjoy and I think I can, can help with. You know, I don't like dog-to-dog -dog aggression, that kind of thing, so I'll pass them on. You know, I've, I've got my own little niches that, that I like. So What is your niche these days? Um, I like um, sort of the nervous dogs, anxiety, fearful dogs, um, um, separation anxieties to a certain degree, um, street dogs, so I like rescue yeah. dogs, um, the Asian dogs coming over, I like to help those. That's a big debate as well. You know, I'm on the fence whether all <laughs> these dogs coming over from the UK. Um, yeah, no, you know, uh, yeah, that's a big, that's a big debate as well. Um, yeah. Um, correct puppy choosing, puppy yeah. problems. Oh, Rachel, that sounds lovely. That sounds yeah. lovely. I must admit, because you know, I've got, I've, when I moved to Scotland, I carried quite a few soft tissue injuries. Mm. And I had to stop putting myself in front of aggressive dogs. I had to stop because it was so dangerous for me because mm -hmm. the level of aggression I was working with, if, if I moved quickly, my knee would give way. And it's like, well, you can't, you have to be yeah. able to get out of the way of a dog that's going to attack you, otherwise yeah. you're going to end up. Um, yeah. I mean, I do deal with aggressive dogs. I'm not avoiding aggressive dogs. It's just, just the dog to dog ones. But, um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're bottom of the list. <laughs> what, what about um, aggression to people? Is that yeah, the yeah. It's like, mm. yeah, I'll, I'll do those. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, I've, um, I don't do as much behaviour work now. I do more, more the pet and dog stuff and teaching. You know, like yourself. Yeah, I love teaching, and I know you. Uh, you love teaching. You're a fantastic tutor. I've been on your courses, and I think you're an amazing yeah. tutor. Um, your first aid courses, I think, are fantastic, and very much, uh, very much supporting your philosophy. And that is, if you're going to get trained by a first aider, you get trained by a professional, and not by a human first aider moving across to the canine world. Yeah. So is yeah. that why you set up your canine first aid company and your canine first yeah, aid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for that reason. And also I started off um, doing this probably about 
um, 11, 12 years ago. Um, it was just a one-off actually for uh, Rochdale RSPCA, the manager there, who, who um, the practice that, that I was at for 13 years, we had a really good relationship with that. We were their vets, the Rochdale RSPCA. And she just asked me, she wanted to come in and do some, some staff training. She said, I've got three new staff and um, could do some first aid training. I said, yeah, 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 sure. But I'll put some, some work together. And they said, can I ask the volunteers? I went, yeah, of course you can. So we had like 14 people. Um, and we it was just like a two and a half, three hour session really. And um, she said, you should do more of this. I'll, I'll get Oldham branch, see if they're, and it, it just kind of snowballed from there, really. Um, but it's only this last maybe four or five years it's really taken off. I've really pushed it. Um, and, of course, in that same time, yeah, lots of lots of other companies are popping up, which is fine. It's absolutely fine, you know. Um, but I, I, I want to use my um, USP, you know, and I don't see why I shouldn't have to use my USP. Um, you know, unique selling point of being an RVN. Um, you know, I have even on my own page where I've promoted the fact that my courses are run by um, a, a veterinary nurse. I've had a couple of competitions come on and, and have a go at me for promoting that. I'm a, I said, this is my page. Really? I'm an RVN. I'm going to promote myself. <laughs> Yeah, so delete, delete. I mean, some of the some of the other companies I get on really well with. Um, you know, we work uh, not side by side, but we communicate. But there are a couple that have given me a hard time. Yeah, um, and the yeah, they're not they're not a veterinary professional, and maybe that's that's why they're a little bit defensive. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm an RVN. I'm going to promote the fact, you know, that I've worked front line with injuries and emergencies for 25 years. Um, I mean, it's it's interesting that you touched on imposter syndrome because I have I mean it's only now in God the Peck and Dogs we now ten years and it's only now that I'm acknowledging myself as an author. So only it's only now people say to me what to do. I'm an author. And it's taken me ten years to actually promote the fact that yeah. you know I've got my master's degree and I'm an author. And so imposter syndrome is massive. And it's normally the people who are incredibly good at their job that are constantly striving to improve themselves that suffer from imposter syndrome because yeah. they realize that it doesn't matter how high up you get in your profession or how um knowledgeable and uh amazing you are at it there's still so much more to learn yeah and it's the people that are coming up that know very little or or rather it's the whole um dunning-kruger effect have you heard of the dunning -Kruger yeah. effect yeah uh, you come off a course and you go oh my god i'm amazing i know everything i'm fantastic and then it's only after they've had years and years of experience that they go, wow, there's like so much to learn. And yeah. And they're the people that suffer from imposter syndrome. And so we do need to promote ourselves and say, you know, for yourself, I'm an RVN, I've got all this experience, I've been running tra training um, courses in canine first aid. And it's the people who um, haven't quite got that accomplished that will point the finger and say, well, why are you... Uh, promoting yourself as an OVN. Yeah, you know I mean? because so, I am. I am. <laughs> it's, it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, 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 it's a bit of a hard time a couple of years back, just because I was outspoken. Well, I'm not outspoken anyway, but for me it was outspoken on, on my own page about, yeah, choosing. I, I mean, maybe there is a space for the for the ones that are run by human human first aid companies maybe you know the powerpoint type ones the basic ones maybe for pet owners or for pet, pet professionals that just want to tick boxes you know yeah. if there's a pet professional that just wants to get the easiest route to be a dog walker or a dog groomer and just wants to do a, um, a tick the box exercise then go to them yeah you, you know if you want to if you want a bit more knowledge and a bit more uh, interaction and, and what have you then come to somebody like me um, who's going to put you through a lot more and you'll learn a lot more information if you want to learn that much then go there if you want to learn that much and 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 learn off of the professionals as well because you know you've been to my course we, we, we I don't use PowerPoint we're around a table that gives um, it gives the opportunity to, for people to share experiences um, yeah. and maybe have little debates and and things like that you know sometimes a room can get a little bit heated but it's good debate you know it's and I'm putting myself out there on the front line sat at the head of that table completely leaving myself wide open for any questions yeah I get I get asked things that only a veterinary professional would know uh -huh. um when you stood up in front of a powerpoint and there's 30 people maybe that dynamic doesn't allow that 
person that's tutoring to be in that position to get bombarded with veterinary questions. You know, I, I know some companies that when they do get asked veterinary questions, they say, oh, I'll make a note of that. Um, I'll email the vet I'll and um, I'll get back to you with the answer. Mm. Yeah, I mean, see for me, because, um, you know, I teach behaviour and teach training and, uh, and I used to co-teach with Ross as well. And for me, to have the stories, you know, to have that um, that depth of knowledge behind the questions. So, you know, if I said to you, oh, I don't know, to, uh, I've, my dog's got a grass seed, what's the best thing to do? Then you would be able to not only tell me what to do with the grass seed, but you would have the stories behind it. Yeah. So I can remember oh, when this happened and that happened and we did this to this dog and that, that dog. And if you haven't got the depth of knowledge or if you're not working in the field, you haven't got the stories to educate people because we, we like being taught by stories, don't we? We're yeah. storytellers as a, as a species. And I think somebody who can't do that is just not, um, they're not displaying underpinning knowledge and therefore they're not getting the information across yeah. to the people who are attending courses with them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that, that's like about five years back, that's one, one, one reason why I started working in Asia as well, um, voluntarily, because first of all, I had the opportunity, but secondly, um, it's always something I wanted to do and I kind of put it off for years and years and I thought, no, I'm going to go traveling again and, and experience this. Um, so I did. And by doing that, being in the shelters, working with street dogs, you see the most extreme situations, you know, um, don't want to go into too much detail, but it's just ex more extreme injuries. The, um, the, the, the quantity of injuries as well. So usually road traffic accidents, traumatic injuries that you're dealing with um, and things that you just don't see in this country um, the, from the diseases that you, I mean, um, distemper is rife in, in Thailand really? and in India. Yeah. Um, last time I saw a distemper case as a vet nurse, um, well, it was actually before I was a vet nurse, while I was working for Dogs Trust. So it's like 26, 27 years ago. That's the last time I saw a case of distemper in the UK personally. Um, but I see I see ten cases every time I go to to um, to, to Asia. It's rife, yeah. Um, and then um, things that again you just don't see in this in this country. So monkey bites, um, cobra bites, scorpion yeah. bites, all those kind of fascinating things. Yeah, yeah. So I think it just brings that even extra um, extra um, depth of knowledge, underpinning knowledge, like you said as well. Yeah. God, what experience? Because I know. Um, where I used to live, there was uh, it was the highest concentration of adders in the country, and so mm. we were always prepared yeah. for adder bites. Yeah. We always carried um, periton, and we always had the phone call ready to to get the home yeah. homeopathic remedies as well for it. Um, but coming across things like monkey bites, it must just be yeah amazing. And I have seen a lot of the videos that you put up because I'm really interested in it more when you put the behaviour videos up. You know of the dog. Yeah moving around and just watching the behaviors that you see because you see them more in packs don't you in the street packs which we don't see yeah. over here now yeah and, and, and that must be fascinating yeah it is you know it's they have especially in india we saw um i mean it happens in thailand as well but when i was staying in india we were actually in quite uh, we were in bangalore um so it was actually quite it's quite busy so and you could see the definite um, stopping points where certain packs of dogs will stop that's their territory boundary mm. um yeah just ends of streets you know just boom stop yeah, yeah. and okay. you could see when one crossed over it got nailed by by the neighboring pack yeah but you yeah. see because I, I find that really interesting because i'm very much in uh, like the pack mentality as you are as well you know and um and i find it really funny when when people are out on the walks and go well i want my dog to say hello to all the dogs but in in their head if you're walking them in the same circuit over and over again then you've got to expect your dog to kick off if a new dog comes into that territory because yeah by walking them in the same place over and over again you are delimiting the territory for that dog so when it sees another dog it's natural behavior it's intrinsic behavior for them to mouth off at the dog and stay out, say stay out of my territory mm. and so to see that in action must be fantastic i can remember from when i was a kid because it was the before you know our dogs could still roam and my dog used to pack up with a couple of the dogs in the street and like that if the streets from we were in field wind if any of the dogs from summerhill came around the dogs would be you know squaring oh you're a summerhill dog you know <laughs> back off kind of thing yeah yeah that's why i think um you know badly run daycares and things like that is 
uh, I'm not, I'm not totally, I mean, I'm not totally anti-dog daycare, but um, cause I do a lot of teaching in them the first aid, but I have some, you know, a couple of friends that have got some really well run ones. Um, but when you see the badly run ones where there's just packs of dogs running around and looks like, oh, they're all enjoying it. Mm, no, they're not. <laughs> yeah, well, they're all having fun. Luck. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> not really. <laughs> But we could, yeah, we could sit for hours on picking all that. <laughs> it's yeah. it's interesting, is it? Because do you think um, do you think your attitude has changed over dog behaviour over the last few years? Are you kind of yeah. more? Oh, you know. <laughs> are, you, are you more? Have you have you kind of? Yeah, I think I've become. I think I've become more, especially this last year. Definitely more passionate about seeing all these videos on on social media and people. Um, sharing them, um, thinking the dogs are all right. Um, before I might just um, sit, you know, and ignore them, but now I'll put comments. If I see another, vet, you know, pet professional put a video of um, I don't know what's the one going around at the moment where the dogs have been pushed down that plastic slide. That's, oh no, I haven't seen that. Yeah. Um, what is that? I, you know, I've I've seen a handful a handful of um, pet professionals sharing that, and I. I mean, I might have left it before, but now I put, can you not see what's happening in this video? Um, you know, like the, the tubes that kids go down on the swimming, uh, swimming baths. Yeah. And yeah, it, it's on, it's on like an end of a building. I, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's a doggy no. daycare. I don't know, but it's a clear plastic tube about that wide. Um, oh. And obviously the dogs have been pushed down the top and the dogs are sliding down backwards. And every dog that comes oh out, my the, God. the dogs are attacking it. Yeah, it's really bad. Um, yeah. Oh, that's horrific. And the peanut butter, you'll have seen the peanut butter one with the cling film and the peanut butter spread and then letting the oh, dog... Really? Eat. Yeah. So, yeah, so I'm putting really serious comments on those now because we shouldn't be sharing those. It's not mm. okay to do that. I mean, so my camera's going out of focus. I, um, I haven't seen them. I haven't seen many of them at all. And... Uh, you know, I can't tell if it's my eyes or my camera, but one of the pictures fell off the wall the other day and it hit my camera because my camera's on the wall for when I'm teaching. Oh, that yeah. the whole the whole room and when I'm teaching. Yeah. And um, one of the photos fell off the wall the other day. That's it. And, it, and my camera kind of went, <laughs> and so I'm trying to put it by. So sorry. Um, I haven't seen them because I get really frustrated where you see... Um, you know, trainers are really getting into proprioception now. Yeah. Proprioception exercises. And you go, you know what? That dog's really unfit and you're not doing any favours by doing what you're doing. Yeah. And so I, I find those um, videos really yeah. cringy. Irritate. They really <laughs> yeah. make me, I mean, they really make me cringe. And you see people doing things because, you know, I'm really hot on age-appropriate training and you see them doing things with young dogs and you go, well, that's a potential cruciate damage, and this is going to. Um, yeah. Oh my yeah. God! You know, what What are you doing? Why are you pushing people so hard to be doing this? But yeah. I haven't seen that slide one, Rach. I haven't seen it at all. That's yeah, I'll, send, I'll send you it. I'll send you it. Yeah, I won't because I'm. What I'm trying not to do is perpetuate the sharing of it because um, mm -hmm. when when I when I critique the um, a few weeks back the the peanut butter on the cling film on the head one. Um, I put it out there, the full video saying, right, why is this not okay? Blah, 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 blah. But what people were doing, were not, were not reading what I'd written. No. And they were sharing the video with laugh comments. And I had to re-message them and said, no, the idea is not to share it. The idea is that this is not correct. Yeah. Oh, right. I just thought it was a funny video. So I was like, so I had to undo all that. So I kind of inadvertently caused it to be shared another 20 times yeah so yeah. so now we just take um, like a freeze frame of it and so people actually can't see the, see the video and, and what have you that's a really good idea yeah that's a good yeah, idea somebody asked last week oh it's just a photograph the video's not there i said yeah because i don't want the video i don't want it perpetuated you know no. being shared yeah because i find that as well you know where um i mean you know we're doing the put the camera down campaign we've been running that yeah for, yeah because i sent Sent you a couple of links of videos. Yeah. I think one got deleted. The the um, I think Ross shared you the shared the uh, Malinois one. I think that got deleted. Yeah. Um, but the bull terrier one, the pit, the pit bull one, um, yeah. yeah, that was pretty scary. It's um some of the stuff we we'll see. I mean, I because I was doing all the editing for put the camera down, 
and I mm. hadn't stopped doing it because it was so upsetting, you, you know, because to try and find the clips to put them together and then edit them and put them into a sequence, mm. you'd be what I'd be watching people the same clip of somebody getting beat about yeah. 30 or 40 times now I was editing. And it was just yeah it, it was just doing my yeah. head in really you know yeah of doing it i mean i, I think there's quite a lot of social like social media pages have come off recently i mean i was on um i was on a fox red lab um one for a few weeks and there was some useful stuff on there and you know the 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 the, the lady that had the page was had had a, a few fox red labs just working gun dogs and that kind of thing so i might be all right but there's lots of pet owners coming on and not only was that not getting to me but I was like oh like all these pet owners were getting these fox red labs and and then they were saying why is my why is this dog doing this why is the dog ripping its beds open right because it's a working dog and you've got it as a pet no, I'm not saying that people shouldn't have them as pets but when you take these breeds on and other breeds obviously um you know then the, yeah actually it has to be a full-time hobby you know you've got to give the dog something to do as well you've got to be interested in in what the dog wants to do and and give it give it a job the old line give it a job um but that even that was upsetting me. I was seeing these fox red labs, like I could see the work potential in them, and that these dogs were just like frustrated, you know. Um, and and then then somebody put a video on a few weeks back, just as uh, a few weeks into lockdown, of um, a lovely, lovely fox red lab bitch in her bed, and a child was playing vets or doctors with the dog. Oh. Goodness kids thing. doctors set out with stethoscope and it was poking things in the dog's ear and luckily this dog was really you know it was it, it was tolerating it but there must have been about 60 comments saying oh this is lovely my, oh, my, it's not this lovely. Is my dog um and it was just it must have showed about 10 micro um um body language it sounded yeah. it wasn't comfortable lip licking and, and um just turn, looking at its owner like that and and i was the only person out of about 60 comments who said this is not right. That dog is not comfortable. The dog's tolerating it, but it's not brilliant. Um, first of all, the dog, you know, dog's in its bed. That's the first rule you teach kids not to approach yeah, yeah. a dog in its bed. Oh my God, I got absolutely roasted. Oh, it's ridiculous. Roasted. Yeah. I, I was know. called an armchair behaviorist. Oh, I was called all the names under the sun um, just for, for standing up and saying, this shouldn't be happening. This is how dog bites happen. Yeah. If that was if that was another breed, I don't want to pick on any breeds, but if it wasn't a lab and another yeah. breed, that child may have been bitten. Not I'm saying don't labs do bite and you know, but you know what I mean. It's, if the I dog hadn't been so it. tolerant, yeah. Um, and when I saw the page owner put a love hat on the video, that's what I said. Right, I'm out. <laughs> I just deleted myself off. I, mean, I was just getting more and more worked up about. <laughs> it's it's hard isn't it i mean i i'm a member of some groups on facebook and i've stopped going in them actually other than advertise my, my you can advertise one day a week so i go in and advertise and i don't get involved mm. and you know there was one that went up a couple of months ago and i kind of went oh god you know i'm so done with this and it was um a gun dog group and uh Oh, I, you know, my, my spaniel, I think it was, is chasing, chasing rabbits and squirrels and, and uh, it's having a great time. And I was like shaking my head and people were going, oh, let it chase. It's fine. It's 10 month old. It's still a puppy. Oh my it God. doesn't matter if it catches a couple of rabbits, it'll be fine. You know, you've got plenty of time to sort it out. And I was <sighs> sitting there going, okay, so it's rabbits today and then it'll be sheep. Yeah. And then and it'll be across the main road. And then it'll be kids. And you yeah. just think, you know you shouldn't be allowing your dog to chase and kill. That's not acceptable under any circumstances, you know, and especially more so if you're going to train as a gun dog, you need to teach your dog to pull back the kill instinct. And so this is a group, it's got a couple of thousand people in the group and they're all going, oh, that's lovely. You've got loads of time to let it grow out of it. And I'm sitting there going, actually, you know, you really haven't. Yeah. You need to stop. Um, Social media at the minute, and I love, I do enjoy social media, and I do think it's got a lot of benefits. Yeah, yeah. But I it's do. also got that whole mentality of the people who get the most likes or the most, you know, give me a love heart, and um, yeah. all of that stuff. People are thinking that they, uh, the experts, or people are going in for the most number of likes rather than um, 
going for expertise because anybody can set themselves up as an expert at keyboard mm -hmm. and I can remember years ago on the forums it was before Facebook so god it would have been the Yahoo do you remember the Yahoo group? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the old yeah. Yahoo group. That's Sean Wade, right? Yeah. Um, MySpace. I, sorry? <laughs> MySpace. I didn't do MySpace. It was always the... I'm sliding down as well. It was always the Yahoo groups. And um, <laughs> I can remember seeing, uh, you, you know, the title underneath people's names. And it would be, you know, expert or something else or something else or something else. And they got the title because of the amount of posts that they'd written or answered to. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and and it's still like that on Facebook now, isn't it? The people with the most likes are the biggest following. They might not necessarily know what they're talking about. Um, yeah. Or because they're saying all of the right words uh, quite often in a fluffy way, you know, like liking seeing children play vet nurse with a dog all over the bed. Um, they're the people that, others listen to because it's what they want to hear yeah rather than saying it. it's a real issue at the minute isn't it yeah it's definitely definitely an issue it's getting worse for sure yeah and it's easy it's easy to uh, make negative comments and berate somebody isn't it from 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 behind a keyboard keyboard warriors keyboard warriors yeah. bless them yeah bless them so something i do want to ask you about definitely want to ask you about is street dogs and it's not you you go through and i'm not going to say which organization you work with because i don't want to get it wrong because i know there's a couple but i know that you go out and help um people who are living on the streets yeah with their dogs yeah it was something yeah. that i if you, i can remember contacting you and saying, oh god i would love to get in touch with this and what did you say to me um oh yeah I, yeah can't remember <laughs> said, you can't do it less because you're not veterinary oh yes and yeah. i was gutted and it was like <laughs> i want to help what can no. i do i want help let me help oh. like no not yeah. qualified <laughs> i've got masters yeah not good enough let your profession go away so yeah is yeah. That's <laughs> yeah i mean uh, it's, i mean it's it's grown so much i mean yeah we've got it's, it's street paws basically so th this was um this was um, developed by um, a lady, brilliant lady called uh, Michelle Southern um, from Newcastle. So it actually started in Newcastle. She was working for a vet practice. Um, I mean, she was vet um, practice manager, I think, I can't remember. Um, and she used to do a lot of um, soup kitchens, uh, helping soup kitchens in Newcastle. And she noticed that quite a lot of the, um, the vulnerable and vulnerably housed and homeless people had dogs. So she started to concentrate on the dog's care and make sure oh, they wow. were fed, what have you. Yeah, so that, that was the first city, actually, where the vets were involved and the vets um, and vet nurses just to go out and help and treat. So it's vaccinations, microchipping, um, flea and worm treatment. Um, and now it's grown so much it's four years now we've just turned four year old we're now in I think 29 cities uh -huh. um, and I think we are in uh, I think we're in uh, we're not doing Scotland because the other charity is Street Vet um, so they started up just shortly after us yeah. um, and they um, they they do the south basically so we've got a gentleman's agreement that um, we do the north and they do the south right. um, but they're going into Scotland as well so we do everything in the middle really north right. um, yeah. um, and I think we're Belfast as well but um, yeah so every city has got their own um, kind of team if you like so I'm, I'm Manchester and I'm Manchester I'm a trustee but I'm Manchester coordinator as well uh -huh. so before lockdown we, we go out once a month into the city centre so we'd split split our friday morning into visiting the booth centre which is um a drop-in centre it's quite a busy drop-in centre they would get maybe 70 or 80 people a day in there um doing activities feeding and what have you um and um brews and showers and that kind of thing um and there's a room there there's a couple of office rooms there so we we used to have the one of the rooms for a couple of hours and the dogs used to come in and, and spend time with us and we just get to know the dogs and make sure that the, the they had coats and we clip the nails and um flea treatment check the microchip all that kind of thing um so yeah so um and then after that we went into after the booth center we then had a wander into town so piccadilly gardens um have a wander around there um if anybody's been uh piccadilly gardens recently i mean it's not um it's it's not for the faint-hearted there's a lot of drug abuse and um 
and things like there's lots of undercover police down there and and drug, lots of drug dealers and what have you so yeah so we used to we used to go on an evening um and then we had a bit of a, a meeting with the um the homeless um detective down there he tapped me on the shoulder one night when i was in there he says are you rachel bean and he has I was in Piccadilly Gardens, I turned yes. around, and um, they just broke a smile. I said, I cops, aren't you? And yeah, come and have a chat. <laughs> and they were just a bit worried about us being, being out there at, at night time, really, okay. um, just a little bit. So, yeah, we changed it to during the day. But, um, yeah, now we're on lockdown. Obviously, we can't, we can't, um, yeah. we can't go, but um, um, I have done a few food drops because what's happening, the council have put most of the homeless people into um, uh, accommodation, either hostels or hotels. It's funny, isn't it, that they can do that um, they, uh, during this, but they can't do it <laughs> before. Normally, yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, what's happened, because they're not on the street, the dogs are not getting fed because normally the dogs get fed by members of the public. You know, they'll, they'll sit outside Sainsbury's and Marks and Spencer's and, you know, the corner Tesco's in, in the city centre and people go in and buy, buy food for the dogs as well as, as, as the owner. So because of being, um, you know, in hotel rooms lot on lockdown, mm -hmm. um, then the dogs are not getting fed and obviously they haven't got finances. Um, yeah. So yeah, we've had a few calls. So normally don't do the food thing because we're vets and vet nurses. We tend to do the medical stuff. It's plenty of people doing food drops for the dogs but um yeah I, d I mean I've got a good relationship with Manchester Dogs Home and they had a lot of food um, um spare so I went and uh, picked a car full of food up from them about mm -hmm. two weeks back and I did I did a food drop so I've, I've you know the hotels so um it's in about five I think of our regular dogs that were just running out of food yeah so yeah, because yeah. I, I was watching it and I'd been following it for ages when you're doing it and I thought oh, I'd really like to do something up here in Glasgow because I'm, I'm between Glasgow and Edinburgh. And I yeah. thought it'd be really cool to get involved with both. I think, I think, think street, I th I think street Vet, I think Street Vet are in Glasgow, I think. So it might be worth contacting them. But I th again, I think, I You've think it's Vet. Yeah, but, uh, but we are, mm, they might need kind of like support staff, but more, more it's more... The fundraising side, you know, if you're not interested in that, and I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not I'm really not very really good. At, I'm not very good at doing that. No, I have to leave that to somebody else. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mind you, I did manage to do some fundraising for Atlanta Animal Welfare. If you saw my videos last week, mm -hmm. one of my interviews, I interviewed um, Junie Kovacs, who's the founder of Lanta Animal Welfare on, uh, on Koh Lanta Island, which is Thailand, which is one of the shelters that I help at. Um, so, yeah, it was a bit of a rare interview because she's quite shy, really. So she had to have the vet next to her to help her. But, I yeah, saw that there was somebody so, yeah. there. Yeah, she, yeah, it was a lovely interview. So it was really just to to see what they're doing, and and um, I managed to yeah to to drum up some uh, some funder. I did a donate button and what have you. So we got about eight hundred quid. So that that'll actually go quite a long way over there as as, uh -huh. as far as food you know feeding. Because what they're having to do now because it's locked down and it's it's quite a transient island as regards tourists. It's a bit of a tourist party. It's not. It's not a party island like PP is, but it's 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 popular, you know. Huh. Um, so um, no tourists, and the restaurants are not open, so the street dogs are not getting fed. Oh, so no. yeah, so Junie actually sent me some little video footage of them feeding the dogs last week uh, out oh, and about. So I've just put a video together this morning. So I just put it on this morning if you want to have a look. Um, I will definitely. Yeah, I did that. So yeah. God, that's great. So, I mean, everything must be up in the air as to when you're going to be back out and about and doing things, and it's all a bit. Yeah, I mean, all over. I mean, I'm actually quite enjoying the break, to be honest, because oh, I yeah. was working flat out, and it's only when you actually stop because you're forced to stop that you realise that you're working too hard. <laughs> too hard. Yeah, um, but yeah, all, all the face to face. Um, Canine first aid workshops just stopped in, in March. Um, so we're, we're on um, kind of rescheduling them um, probably September, maybe not even September, maybe back end of September onwards. Um, um, I, I am writing my course online as well, which is a big pivot for me. Um, yeah. you know, I, was, I was always not 100% not dead against it, but I think while I've got this opportunity to write it, it's going to be good for people that maybe can't make a course yeah or they just want a little pet owners that want a little bit more self-knowledge um people that maybe don't like 
you know being in groups or socializing or can't drive or or whatever yeah so um so a, i think there's a little niche for an online one and I, i've made it quite personal as well all, all the photographs are, are, are real cases you know i just pulled them off off the internet any demonstrations i've done on my dog so i just filmed a couple this morning put a tonic on wisp and that kind of thing. so they're actually my dogs you know that are brilliant demoing and what have you so hopefully that on be a little bit different from from all the other ones some of the other companies are doing virtual classrooms and stuff uh, yeah. yeah virtual classrooms are hard i'm doing that at the minute because yeah. that last week was when the instructors were supposed to be up in scotland mm. for the first practical course and we've put it back until the end of august and i was teaching last week i'm teaching again on saturday and it's really difficult trying to get everything across like this when you're teaching and you want um you want interaction and you want questions and you, yeah. want, you know here have a feel this this is this piece of equipment pass it around and have a play with it well you can't can you so it's yeah that's it really yeah tricky but um are you still doing your written side of it you know the ocn side of it yeah, yeah. I mean, those, those. Um, I mean, we're hopefully going to get um, them through as a qualification. But I'll, I'll be using a satellite, so yeah. Um, I've got a couple of satellites. Hopefully, um, CIDBT. Um, but obviously, everything's on hold at the moment. It's just like it's just stalled at the moment. So we just we just got to wait till everything fires back up again. Yeah. And in the meantime, you've got balance in your life, and you can do other things, and you can go online, yeah. and you can interview people, and you can be in. Yeah. And yeah, so it's great. Um, I just want now you did a lot with Manchester Dogs Home, didn't you? Before we finish off, because that was something that was in in the papers. Craig, how long ago was it now? Um, six years ago, I think. Six years. Yeah, I think so. The fact of the, the fire. The fire, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's fire. six years ago. Yeah, six, seven years ago, maybe. Yeah. Is that when you started getting involved with them? Are you in, were you involved with them before then? No, I was involved with them before that. Yeah, um, I only really go if if they've got um, like a super serious problem dog. Um, sometimes they just need a third opinion. Uh -huh. um, unfortunately, I mean, I do like working at the blunt end um, of, of rescue. Um, you know, I've worked at the corporate side and, and now I'm working on, on, on you know, um, at the blunt end really. And, um, and euthanasia sometimes has to be, has to be, you know, has to happen. Um, you know Manchester that's the clue Manchester like a lot of big cities has a big gang culture um some of the dogs that end up at Manchester Dogs Home have have been picked up um you know by dog wardens and what have they've just been turfed out by by um by gangs these, these dogs are not safe um you can't you can't send them off to a family home you know so yeah. unfortunately decisions have got to be made yeah are oh, there still lots of dogs uh getting turfed out that were bait dogs um, I think, um, I don't think they so much get turfed out. I think they get discovered. Um, usually, unfortunately, they, you know, they, they, they don't live to survive, you know, they don't live to tell the tale. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, it's a difficult one. I, th I think, because I'm not really actively involved in the dog fighting thing. I mean, I could find out, but, um, mm. I don't think it's reduced um, because of the different cultures we have um, now in the UK. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of the dog fighting rings, um, uh, uh, I have to say, are, are, are foreigners, you know, because yeah. it's not illegal in their country. So when they come over to this country, then they just carry on their sport. Yeah. 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 So it's, um, it, yeah, we certainly have to be more vigilant now, dog theft, um, you know, letting your dogs be spotted you know I, I don't leave the dogs in the car or anything like that um in anywhere town town wise um because yeah it is. You, can't, you can't leave them tethered out you know it'd be nice sometimes you know if rob's faffing around in the garden is just leave the dogs out and i it's not too bad if i'm there but i want to if i go out and leave the dogs like i'm, I'm paranoid because <laughs> we have you know the white vans going up and down our street slowly yeah. um they're just looking for stuff you know oh, the, oh there's two nice dogs at you know number whatever and, and there's so many delivery men out now as well you can't you, you know a lot of the guys who are like delivering from amazon for amazon or for dpd and they're using higher vans and the white vans and so people are now used to white vans coasting up and down the street mm. it's just a delivery driver that's got lost 
and yeah. before you know it the dogs have gone um yeah. i'm like you i'm paranoid my dogs do not go in the garden on their own at all yeah. and um if we're in the back and the doors open the back doors open if i can see the dogs it's fine if i can't see them i'm out there you know come yeah. in yeah. um i yeah. just it, it just makes my yeah it wouldn't, wouldn't take much to get a labrador in a van would it yeah, just. <laughs> well, I don't know. Was Dante's Dante's like <laughs> he's back off, mate? And you go and yeah. I mean, even now I go to give him a bit of food. You know, yeah. if I if I've got like a strawberry heart or something, I'll go. Yeah. Do you want this? And he like have a good sniff of it. It's like, what are you giving me? What are you giving me? <laughs> <laughs> I might have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Both of mine be straight in there. Would they? <laughs> it's so funny. No, Spudwood, my spaniel would. Dante's really discerning. He's like. Uh, I don't know what have you got? <laughs> Can I have it? And he won't. He won't take stuff automatically. He has a good old sniff around it. And yeah. That I've taken it. He's not. Um, he's not your typical. What the class is a typical lab at all. Yeah. <laughs> so are you still going to be involved with hydrotherapy, Rachel? When we go out. Hydrotherapy. Yeah. 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 I mean, I do, I do the refresher, the first aid refreshers for um, the National Association of Registered canine hydrotherapist so yeah um and we're just working on being back in with the the chair because um, they've changed all their all their standards so we're just working through that as well yeah so yeah i mean it's a discipline i really like um so I've, you know, I've had a little bit a little I've not, I've, not, I've not passed any of the courses or anything but i've had a little bit of tuition um you know here and there um from from hydrotherapists um, marie johnston um um who is who is the um physio uh, veterinary physio for the uk uh, the gb uh, agility team and all that kind of thing yeah she's really good um so yeah she's she's given me a few a few lessons um and, and a couple of others um so yeah i've got a, i've got a basic knowledge enough enough to when i go to asia is to actually teach um, just some basic and, and I mean really really basic I mean one of the shelters that I went to in Bangalore in India they had a pool um, and it was just a it was a pool but with no filtration so what they had to do they filled it with water on the Sunday um, uh -huh. and then they emptied it on Wednesday because by the time I had a few dogs in over 40 hours it was filthy they just pulled the plug and refilled it um, but what they were doing they were they were st standing on the outside of the pool and these poor dogs that were like paraplegic they were just they were pulling them around the pool with a rope from the side and it's not that it's not that they you know they didn't mean to do any harm they just didn't know how to do it properly yeah. so i said right <laughs> and i got in yeah i got in the pool and put harness on show them exactly how to how to do it with these disabled dogs yeah so even just those tiny changes um were, was really beneficial yeah well, they would have loved that as well because you've got people doing their absolute best they can for the dogs not realizing like the damage potentially that they're causing, but you know, yeah. doing it with a good heart and good intention. Yeah, yeah. And, and they must have been thrilled to have somebody like you go, well, actually, if you do it like this, yeah, much better for yeah. the dog and beneficial all around, which is awesome. Yeah, so it's, it's really rewarding as well. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think you're awesome. I think all this stuff that you do is amazing, and I've worked with you quite a bit over the years and at Crofts and um, yeah. put my head together on court cases and it's just been great and I'm really excited to see what's going to happen for you when we come out of lockdown and definitely be on one of your um, first aid courses again because I thoroughly enjoyed it last year in Scotland it was great yeah really brilliant enjoyed. yeah I'll have to get myself back up to Scotland I mean it helps that my, I've got some family up there so my brother and sister are in Edinburgh so because my sister's a vet okay so, yeah, yeah. My brother's um, um, town, town planner. He's, he's just come back from New Zealand, actually. He's just had two years in New Zealand with his girlfriend, who's a doctor. So they've, they've been back maybe three or four months now. Yeah. Where in New Zealand were they? Um, or, um, no, my friend's in Auckland, who I'm interviewing tonight. Um, other end of Auckland, Wellington. Wellington. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, Windy. It's really, really yeah. windy in Wellington. I, I get mixed up where everybody's also. where everybody is. <laughs> yeah, Wellington, Wellington. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't cope with it. We drove down. Me and a friend drove down from Auckland when the premiere of Return of the King came out. Yeah, we drove down, and I mean, it was amazing driving through like all these snow-capped mountains and stuff. But oh my god, it was so windy. It was yeah. unbelievably windy. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I've been to Auckland. 
the girl, the girl, the, the vet nurse that I'm interviewing tonight, um, um, she was, she was uh, just a bit of a kid, really, 16 year old, when I was doing my vet nurse training. Uh -huh. so I've known her like over 25 years. So she's in New Zealand now. Um, um, I don't think she, she's just finished a vet nurse and she's doing more behaviour stuff. Uh -huh. um, but she's got a good little business over there. So I'm interviewing her tonight. So Funny. it's weird because she's got this New Zealand accent now from a, from a broad Oldham accent. Like, she's a kid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, how funny. Yeah. yeah. It's, I think it's an easy accent to pick up. I think it is. Yeah. My son, when we come back from my son from New Zealand, my son had a bit of a New Zealand twang. And it was... Uh, yeah, some people pick up accents, don't they? I, I mm. do. Um, my brother came back after two years. His accent's not changed. But I know I would pick it up. I remember when I was about 14, I went on holiday to Tenby in Wales with, with, a, with another family. My friend, one of my best friends at the time with their family for like a week or 10 days in Tenby and I came back with a Welsh accent. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't pick accents up. Thank I you. Do. I don't. I've lived, <laughs> lived all these different places and I've never come home with an accent other than... Yeah, you've still got your North East accent. Just a you? tempering, you know, it's like you talk slowly, you drop yeah. all the slang, you don't use... Um, <laughs> but I, since I've moved to Scotland, I am picking up some Scottish words. Yeah, my, my sister, my sister's, uh, her accent hasn't changed, but she's picking up Scottish words, yeah, because uh -huh. her, her other half, he's, he's, uh, he's Scottish as well, so yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I've lost, I mean, I, I'm from Durham, so I, 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 I had a Durham accent, but I, I haven't got it, that. I haven't got it now, it's kind of a mixed uh, Lancashire Durham accent, there's some words that, that, like when I say toast, toast. Or <laughs> a, bit toast, a bit of toast, toast. and a film. <laughs> film. <laughs> yeah, but apart from that, I've kind of yeah, I've got a weird accent now. I didn't yeah. know you were from Durham. Yeah, Banner like Castle. Prince Bishops. Yeah, Barnard Castle. I knew you were from Barnard Castle. I knew that because I've seen you doing a lot of Barnard Castle stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. lovely, isn't it? Yeah, it's lovely, lovely little town. Yeah, really nice. Mm. Mm. So have you got more interviews lined up? I have, yeah. Um, I've got Kelly tonight. Tomorrow I've got um, Claire Lawrence, who's um high peak um, dog trainer, um, tomorrow. And then Friday I'm interviewing uh, one of the vets that I work with here, actually. Um, she's a mobile vet. Um, so she does a lot of holistic stuff. So you might be interested, actually, because she does... Um, um, she does veterinary acupuncture on, on oh, dogs. Great. Um, um, I do, I, I go along with her sometimes for house visits. So, um, if she's got a cat that she needs to take blood off and what have you, she'll just give me a ring. She says, oh, you're free at two o'clock. So yeah, yeah. Oh, can you just come and hold this cat? So yeah, so we do work together. Um, Brilliant. and her and her husband, they're both German and, um, uh, her and her husband worked for the PDSA for a lot of years. Um, and then he's gone into private practice and then she started, um, a mobile vet. Um, practice yeah so yeah um, so I'll interview her tomorrow um, I've got the times to sort out I've got um, so I'm trying to interview people that have got a dog link but are not just like dog trainers or yeah, no, me too. that kind of thing just um, so yeah I, I met um, Juliet Myers in January we were doing um, um, a seminar together she was she was on the next day I did a little an hour on a, a seminar on street dogs or working with street dogs um, and she was on the next day and she's um, a comedian and she's got a rescue dog from Portugal called Fantastic. Homer um, so she writes for um, Sarah Millican um, oh. the radio show and eight out of ten cats so she's um, and she's a stand-up comedian anyway um, and so yeah I'm going to interview her hopefully next week sometime so that's a bit of a hoot um, and uh, she's mad as a bucket of frogs and um, and Wednesday next week, hopefully, um, uh, again, it's somebody I've known for 20, 25 years and uh, who I met at Dogs Trust is um, Diane Newdale, who is the original Jet from Gladiators. Yes. 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 So, I know about your relationship with Jet. <laughs> yeah. So she, yeah, we're going to do one and just about how we met and, and dogs and uh, yeah, because she hasn't got a dog at the moment just because of her lifestyle. Really. She's always moving around and teaching and what she's doing now and all that kind of thing. So hopefully next Wednesday, we just need to sort of time out. Um, yeah, so I think that's it up to now. Yeah. Great. Oh, have fun. <laughs>
have fun there. Rachel, it's been an absolute joy, haven't you? And I can't believe how quickly the time goes. As soon as I start talking to somebody, it's just like, <laughs> okay, I've got to say goodbye now. <laughs> um, it's been great talking to you. And then this will go out as a podcast as well, because I've got, I've got it running as a podcast as well as a video. Yeah, excellent. Um, which is great. So um, I hope when we come out of lockdown, it just all goes way for you, but keep your life balanced as well, because that's yeah. really important. Yeah, you know, I think so I, and so in demand, it's really easy just to lose. It sight. is. We're bed really, and we're resting, and yeah, yeah. I think that's what happens. But you, you know, people can tell you till they're blue in the face. You know, stop working so hard. But when you're in it and doing it, and you know, I went for so many years working as a vet nurse with very low wages, and and then you know, I just built this up up over the last ten years, and then boom, you're in demand, and it, mm. it's not you. Know, do you, it's really difficult to say no 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 because that's what you've worked towards is to to get all this work coming in but yeah yeah hopefully after after this is all finished it'll be a more sensible approach she says <laughs> <laughs> well hopefully you'll have it so that you can get your online course done and then that can just take care of itself you don't have to be yeah. there presenting it all of the time so that'll take quite yeah a bit of and i've got i've got three or four um, other ideas for courses as well i mean i could do a cat one online and you know there's a few other ideas that i'm kind of throwing around yeah great that would be really cool rachel it's been awesome talking to you and i'm sure oh, thank you again really soon yeah thank you for asking me it's great oh my pleasure <laughs> you take it steady have fun i and, will uh yeah here's to the end of lockdown Han. yes <laughs> okay, thanks for coming on Ray. all right no problem see ya bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.